Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here and welcome back to the railway. Today I'm reviewing an LNER steam locomotive by Backman. <laughs> Currently I own two Backman B1 locomotives, and they're the locos that you can see behind me. Both of them are extremely poor quality, and both of them are essentially useless. They're split chassis locomotives, which basically means they've got dated mechanisms, but that's not what makes them useless. Not long after I got them, the plastic inserts in the metal wheels began to warp and bulge to the point where they were catching on the valve gear and coupling rods, and the only way I could fix them was to remove those plastic inserts. And as a result, the wheels just look awful on those models now. But I had no choice, it was either have the wheels look awful or have the models break down entirely. So I think it's fair to say that these B1s were just a complete waste of time and money. However, recently I spotted on Backman's website that there is a B1 in Backman's current range. It is DCC ready, which means it must have a different chassis to the old split chassis B1s, and it's also extremely expensive with an RRP of £179.95, which hopefully means the quality of the latest B1 is going to be much higher than on these, and hopefully the level of detail and the features will be much improved as well. Now, unfortunately, past experience of Backman has taught me that just because a model is in Backman's current range and it's very expensive, it isn't necessarily going to be worth buying or any good at all. But that's what I want to find out, so with some curiosity and quite a bit of trepidation, I picked up this. I bought it from Model Railways Direct for a pretty good discount, actually. This ended up costing me £125.96, which is quite a bit more of a discount than your typical 10 to 15%. And so far, this has been a model that's really slipped under my radar. I've never tried a modern Backman B1, and I've really not heard that much about what they're like. Looking at the front of the box, I can see some evidence that this isn't going to be the quality and high-spec loco that I hope it's going to be, but we'll get onto that later on. Anyway, quite an interesting loco to look at, because obviously there are older versions of this model available, and there's also a Hornby B1 available, which is pretty good as well. So, is this one worth buying, or should we leave it on the shelves to be discounted even further? Well, let's find out. So if you're buying this model from a retailer that sells models at RRP, which some of them do, then this model could set you back £179.99, which is about £10 more expensive than your typical new Acura scale locomotive, such as the Manor, which sell for about £170. With the 15% discount that you'll get at most retailers, this becomes a little bit cheaper by £10 or so than one of those Acura scale locos. So, in terms of expectations, I'm expecting something quite similar to the Acura scale manner in terms of quality and features. I wonder if that's what I'm going to get. No comment. Anyway, let me show you the end of the box. So, the product code is 31 717. It's the LNER B1 class, number 1264, in the LNER lined green, and it has the 8-pin DCC socket. That suggests that this could be a little bit dated, doesn't it? Because most modern locos will have a next 18 or a 21-pin, or some other socket that isn't the 8-pin. 8 8-pin's 8 a little bit old-fashioned now. But either way, let me show you the back of the box. So here's a brief history on the B1. If you'd like to pause and read that, feel free to, although I will give you some info on the class in just a second. For now, though, I'm genuinely curious to see what this is like. Is it going to be worth all that money? And even for, you know, £125 that I spent, there's still an expectation here for this to be decent. Right off the bat, I can see the loco and tender are not connected, so there's, by the looks of it, no electrical connection between the two which means no tender pickups, and it also means that you've got to cram your DCC decoder into the loco, if that's something you'd like to fit. So, a strong start indeed. Here we've got the exploded diagram, which does show the chassis, actually. And yeah, that's not a split chassis, so we have indeed got a different design here, which is good to see. In terms of the other features, those are not clear at the moment, so I will have to open this up later on 
and see what it's like. Uh, you've got a little bit of information down at the bottom there and nothing on the back. We've also got a more modern looking booklet here, product maintenance and care. Now, is this gonna be generic? Yes. <laughs> Right, well, we don't need to bother with that then. Right, anything else? No, I don't think so. So, let's open this up and see what we get. Are there any accessories? Yes, I can see them in the top. So I guess we'll start with that. Let's have a look. All right, so mainly this is brake rigging. We've got brake rigging for both the Loco and the Tender. And we've also got cylinder drain cocks and also vacuum pipes. And that's it, no screw link couplings or anything like that. So either this model doesn't come with them or they're pre-fitted, we'll see in just a minute. Okay, let's open this up then. Let's have a look at the finish because regardless of the sort of features and detail of the model itself, hopefully it will at least have been decorated to modern standards with a quality finish and whatnot. So let's see, yep. Yep, yeah, that certainly does seem to be the case. So we've got a very rich looking rendition of LNER Green, which looks pretty great. And the coal load in the tender has a, a particularly pleasing finish to it. It's not that separate die cast coal load that we often see on Backman Locos. Looks like it's part of the molding, but uh, yeah, good molding at that. Okay, well, since the two aren't connected, let's pull the tender out to start with. And here it is, yeah, beautifully painted. That is noticeable right from the off. Also noticeable is that the leading axle of the tender has been smashed out of position. That's unusual. Most Backman Locos do come perfect these days, uh, although it doesn't matter too much because there are no tender pickups to be knocked out of kilter. So hopefully I'll be able to just readjust that. All right, but yeah, despite the obviously dated nature of the tender, it's well presented in this modern livery. Okay, well, let's take a look at the Loco then. Let's lift it up. All right. And there it is. And noticeably, this is quite lightweight for a model that costs up to £180. And the reason is plastic body construction. So plastic running plate, unfortunately. Plastic boiler, plastic firebox, plastic smoke box. Yeah, a very plasticky model, unfortunately, uh, which doesn't surprise me because the old bodies were plastic. And by the looks of it, this is just the old body, possibly with some superficial updates, but ultimately pretty much the same thing. So let's hold it with the tender. Oh, I just can't believe we've not got any tender pickups on this. I mean, come on, at this sort of price, that is just unacceptable. But the model looks okay, and we will take a closer look at the level of detail in just a second. But first of all, here's some brief history on the B1s in real life. The LNER B1 was introduced in 1942 to the design of Edward Thompson for mixed traffic. A substantial 410 locomotives were built in total between 1942 and 1952, with the intention to recreate the success of the Hall Class or the Black Five from the Great Western or the LMS respectively. However, because of the pressures of wartime, the class had to be built pretty cheaply. To achieve this, as many existing design elements as possible were reused, which avoided having to develop new ones. The class used just two cylinders rather than the three that was preferred by Gresley, and the boiler was almost identical to the one used on the B-17, but with a larger grate area and a higher boiler pressure. The resulting engines were extremely successful though, although notably not of the same high quality as some Gresley designs due to their slightly uncomfortable ride apparently. Nevertheless, this didn't affect the engine's ability to do their jobs, and they worked successfully right through until 1961, when the first withdrawal was made. By 1967, the final member of the class had been withdrawn from service, with only two of them preserved today. So there it is, up close and personal for you, the Backman B1. And I do hope that the Backman fanboys are bracing themselves at their keyboards ready to try and defend this one because it's going to take quite some defending. The verdict is in and I would say this is a perfectly pointless model. I can't think of a single reason why anybody would want to buy this thing. Why? Because the Hornby B1 exists and it wipes the floor with Backman's B1 in pretty much every area. So why is this B1 so inferior to the Hornby B1? Well, first of all, it's lightweight. 
In fact, it's 15 grams lighter than the old B1 with the original chassis. So well done, Backman. Let's redevelop the chassis and make it lighter. Realistically, that's probably because they decided to cram the DCC socket into the Loco rather than putting it in the tender where it belongs. And because of that empty space for the decoder and the socket inside the Loco, the Loco is less massive as a result. And sure enough, the Hornby B1 is about 10 grams heavier than the Backman one. The Hornby one also has an electrical connection to the tender, meaning that the DCC socket is in the tender and also that the tender wheels pick up power so that the Hornby B1 has twice as many pickups as the Backman one, so it's much more reliable. Also, because the Backman body is so old and Backman haven't updated it properly, the detail really does suck. Look at the side of the cab, these handrails look really awful. Not the handrails themselves, I suppose, but more the holders. These are really big, chunky things. Look at the Hornby ones, and those are much finer and more realistic. Also, the cab walls are so thick that the glazing on the Backman B1 is set right back into the cab, not flush with the outside of the cab, which makes it look like a cheap toy. The Hornby one, much better than that. Look at the Backman smoke box door. Look at the way the smoke box darts has been fitted. So the bottom half of it is molded to the smoke box door. The top half is separately fitted into a gigantic hole, which is really distracting and unrealistic. Again, can't see things like that and take it seriously, unfortunately. And the same has been done with the lamp bracket on the smoke box. It's just a piece of metal that's been slotted into a huge hole and then bent upwards by the looks of it. Not very realistic. The Hornby one looks miles better. It's got a fully separately fitted smoke box dart, beautifully separately fitted and properly molded lamp bracket, and even separate lamps on its lamp brackets, which look much better. Also, check out the detail on the Backman running plate. Very little fidelity in these parts, and the molding quality is awful. Look at this piece. Two halves of the mold not lined up properly there, so it looks terrible. Compare that with Hornby's, look at this, we've got beautifully moulded parts, separately painted as well where necessary, picked out, and much more definition in these parts as well. There's also a quality metal reverser rod, which looks a lot better than the Backman one, which is just cheap plastic. Finally, look at the Backman cab. How can Backman charge £180 for this? What a laughing stock they have become. Here's the Hornby cab. <clears throat> Looks a little different, doesn't it? Look at all those separately painted parts, the separate details, the painted gauges, the separately fitted regulator, and then back to Backman's. Up to 180 quid? No, I don't think so. So yeah, really disappointing. Not, I have to admit, unexpected. This is pretty much what I've seen from Backman before, but it was worth getting one to check, and now everybody knows that this is a loco to avoid. Or at least it is for the most part. It's not all bad, and I have to say the decoration looks fantastic. So the finish is great, yet yeah, possibly even better than the Hornby one. It's the only feature that is better, but I will give credit where credit's due. The lining looks excellent on the boiler. This has been done much better than on the older B1, and it is extremely sharp looking. The running plate has also been nicely lined, and the side of the cab is fully lined too, with the LNER numbering and a tiny little printed builder's plate too. The wheels are also excellent, much, much better than on the older B1, so that is a worthwhile improvement. You can see these have also been lined, and they're also extremely well produced. The front buffer beam is also very well painted, it's got the lining and the running number on board. No screw link couplings provided, unfortunately, but we do have metal buffers, and these buffers are sprung. That's quite a nice feature there. And across the side of the boiler, we do have some pipework and also these handrails. Again, the holder's a little bit chunky, but the pipework is absolutely fine. The whistle and safety valves are also well produced. The whistle is just a moulded part, but the safety valves are turned metal, and the quality of those is pretty good. They kind of stand out as being a decent quality feature on an otherwise very tacky model. And I think that's probably all there is to mention, really. It's an old body that clearly dates back a long way, and the lack of detail and plastic construction of it really isn't doing enough to convince me that this was worth £180, or even the £125 or so that I paid. Let's take a look at the tender then, which again is beautifully presented. We've got this transitional lettering on the tender, which looks fine, and all of the lining is particularly crisp, nothing wrong with this at all. 
even the underframe is fully lined and to be fair the molded detail on the tender here really isn't that bad it does the job and there's even a water scoop between the frames there are some separate controls and such built into the tender as well as more of these relatively chunky looking handrail holders the coal load isn't bad at all actually it's perhaps a little bit chunkier than you'd expect on something modern and i think looking at it up close reveals that and while the coal load is technically removable, half of the coal bunker comes away with it when you do remove it, so you can't pop that out and replace it with your own coal. The solution to that is not to buy the loco. And then around the back, we've got molded lamp brackets. Yeah, not looking that great. Big chunky handrails again, and a similarly detailed buffer beam, which does have sprung buffers. And then we've got the NEM coupling fitted to the back of the tender as standard, and there's also one fitted to the front bogey of the loco. So to sum it up, it's an ancient model with poor detailing, which has been painted nicely, but this is not enough to mask how poor the model itself is. However, the chassis appears to be much more modern than the body, so that's what I want to sort of look at next. We're going to get this down onto the track, we'll test its performance for the first time, and then we'll open it up to see if inside lies a bit of quality at last. So there it is, the Backman B1 down onto the track. I've just filmed the initial performance test and running in, and I'll show you how that went in just a second. After that, I did a quick disassembly just to film the mechanism, and that's what I want to talk about now. So actually, the mechanism is better than I expected. I'm quite surprised, actually. It's still not the best, and it's certainly not good enough to redeem what is a poor loco overall, but like I say, better than expected. So first of all, obviously, as we've already noted, no tender pickups whatsoever. That means that the Loco relies entirely on the Loco driving wheels, which do have wiper pickups on them, as you can see. We've also got this awful drawbar design, which is insecure, it's not screwed, it just hooks around a little nubbin on the tender, and you've just got to hope it stays on there. You can't really couple them together on the track, so you've got to kind of couple it off the track and then try and keep those together while you put it on the track. It's really quite fiddly. The base keeper plate though is quite easy to remove with just four screws and as you can see this is fully removable so that you can clean the pickups and also the bearings which are proper separately fitted ones. This is not what I was expecting. On some of Backman's other so-called upgraded chassis there have been no separate bearings whatsoever but this one has them which is really great to see. It's also got a nice simple drive with just one driven axle which is also more than adequate. To remove the body, I left the rear screw out from when I removed the base keeper plate, and then you pull the back of the chassis upwards and disengage it from the front, and the chassis comes out. And as you can see, it's a very bare bones chassis. It is die cast and relatively heavy, which is obviously necessary given the cheap plastic body. Here's the motor. It's not clear whether this is a three or a five pole motor, so I won't comment on that, although I will say the slow speed performance isn't fantastic, although that could just be down to the gearing. I am fairly sure though that there's no flywheel because there's really no room for one in there in addition to the worm drive. And then we've got the slightly old fashioned eight pin DCC decoder socket, which is here in the loco, not in the tender. So there's not an awful lot of space for a decoder here no speaker provided, and also no designated space for one either. So while you may be able to fit a small speaker into this loco, it's certainly not what you'd call sound friendly. And obviously no lights or anything like that. Like I say, it's a very, very bare bone chassis. And then the gauge comes in reasonably reliably at 14.2 to 14.3 millimeters back to back, which is just about right, slightly below the standard. So yeah, some pleasing aspects in the performance. Great to see the proper bearings on the axles, that's good. And nice to have it easy to access and serviceable too. So with that, let's jump back in time and I'll show you that first performance test. Right, moment of truth then. Will I start to get some of my money's worth where the performance is concerned? Right, well, let's see if it works at all. Forwards direction, let's give it some gentle juice. Here goes. I'm up to 30% power there, and it's just started. All right. Yeah, that seems, it seems nice and smooth at the very least. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So, yes, it works, and it looks pretty decent, actually. I like the motion and everything. And the wheels, they don't seem to have swollen and <laughs> sort of jammed the rods up. 
The tender doesn't seem to be on though. Now has that derailed or did I just not put it on correctly? That's a good question. I think it's probably got an issue. Let me just whip it off and see. Right, yeah, it was that axle that I fixed at the start. Uh, that seemed to have uh, come out of position again, so, hmm. Not good. Um, ah, this is so annoying. Hang on. Okay, so I've just adjusted that tender axle. I now know that it is in the correct position, so if it derails and starts doing that again, then I know that we've got an issue with that. Uh, anyway, let's just see if this is going to be okay. I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, it seems all right. Let me give it a 50% speed test to show you kind of what the gearing is like. So let's go by at 50. Ready? Yeah, so it goes at quite a pace, that's for sure. But it does seem to be, I suppose, able to do the slow speeds, although let's do a, a crawl and just verify that. So let me turn this up very gently. Again, the instructions do recommend running these in. So before I draw any conclusions from the performance, I will run this in for the full 30 in each direction. But that looks pretty good. It's cogging quite a bit, but it doesn't seem to be stalling, which is quite impressive, I suppose, given the limited number of pickups. They must at least be well adjusted. And yeah, if that was a bit smoother, that would be ultra impressive. It's quite clearly cogging, but maybe that'll improve with running in, I'm not sure. Yeah, th there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the performance, let's be honest. It does seem to be a lovely performer. Is there any torque in the mechanism? Let me put my fingers in front and then turn it up to 50 and see. Ready? Yep. So that suggests a good quality motor, plenty of torque, and the gearing is good enough so that it can turn its wheels like this under an obstruction, which is good. So yes, the performance does seem to be absolutely fine, or at least it does here on the straight. So with that, let's run this in. Let's go for half speed forwards for 30 minutes. All right, so it's very lively, quite quick, very quick actually, but no slowing down around the curve, which is great. And I have to say so far, despite the lack of pickups, it does seem to be running really nice and reliably. Now, obviously, at the moment, the wheels and pickups are brand new and they're nice and clean. I would expect that as they become a bit more dirty over time, perhaps this reliability might begin to diminish due to the lack of tender pickups. So it is strongly advisable to keep the wheels very clean on this. And as you can see, while the wheels are clean, the performance is good and reliable. So performance seems to be very strong. Lots of torque, nice range of speeds. Hopefully the crawl will be a bit smoother once this is running. But apart from that, no complaints on performance. So I'll continue to let this run and then we'll come back and I'll couple this up to something. All right, well, that did not go ever so well. The Loco itself is running fine, but when I was running this in in reverse, I've actually had to do it without the tender because it kept derailing on Gordon's Hill reliably to every single lap. Now, I should say, to be fair to Bankman, obviously the quality of my track work isn't great, and your mileage on this will obviously vary, particularly if you've got better quality track work. However, what I can say is that other locos I've tried don't do this, and I can also say that there is an issue with the wheels in this tender of some description, because that front axle has come out of position on two occasions now. If I had to guess what the issue is, I think it's something to do with the lack of up and down travel in some of the tender axles, so that when this enters or exits the incline on Gordon's Hill, some of the wheels are coming off the track and then not necessarily going back down onto the track properly. It looks like that's what's happening, but I'm not too sure. That is only in reverse though, in forwards direction it's fine, so I should be able to continue the review. Other than that, no problem at all with the Loco, it's remained nice and smooth, and there does seem to be a lot of torque in this motor slash mechanism too, which is good to see. Having said that, the crawl wasn't the best when I tested this initially. It was pretty slow, but it wasn't very smooth. So let's try it again now that it's properly run in and warmed up. Let's give it a little bit of juice. All right. So yeah, it's pretty similar, still very slow, I would say, but quite juddery too, not really a smooth motion there. Let's speed it up a bit. Yeah, very juddery there. You can see the tender sort of oscillating. A bit more. And then finally it becomes a bit smoother at that speed. So yeah, 
Not sure if it's a three or a five pole motor, like I said earlier on. If I had to guess, I would say it's a three, given the way this performs, but I don't know for sure. Again, it could just be the gearing that's responsible for that. But either way, a better motor, better gearing, and a flywheel might have improved this, I think. However, I must say it's really nice to see a loco with good torque that doesn't slow down around the curves. If at nothing else, to prove it's not my controller to blame, because that's really, really good. So no shortage of power whatsoever. And in fact, the haulage capacity of this thing is a lot better than expected. It comes in at 0.4 newtons, which is about 25 coaches on straight and level track. That's actually about the same as a Hornby LNER Pacific. So to say this is relatively lightweight and much smaller than one of those Pacifics, I actually think that's perfectly good. So to test the haulage, I've set up not a massive rake of coaches actually, just five LNER Teaks, and that should allow us to observe how this performs around curves and such with a load. So with that, let's see how smoothly I can couple. Let's give it a try, here goes. All right, steady. Steady, not too steady. Yeah, so a little bit juddery, but it's still possible to be quite controlled with it, so that's good. I heard a little snap. Is that the coupling hook dropping? Yep, yeah, I think it was. All right, very nice. All right, so Bankman B1 with a rake of passenger coaches. I just thought they looked better with this being in the green. So let's give it a try. Let's go for about 40 speed because I would say 50 is a bit too quick for me. So there we go at 40. All right. And on the middle line, I've put the Hornby B1 onto the track. And I would say, well, it certainly has a better mechanism, that's for sure. The performance, I would say, is similar, if maybe slightly better. I would say the crawl is just a little bit smoother and it's always going to be more reliable because of the additional pickups. But otherwise, yeah, there's not a lot in it. They do perform quite similarly. And then on the very inside line, I've got my older split chassis B1 with the old mechanism. And actually, do you know what? The performance of this, now that I've made the fixes on it, really isn't that bad. I don't think it's the performance that caused Backman to redesign this chassis. I suppose it's more the tendency of those split axles to fail and also the lack of DCC support. But anyway, let's see how the other B1 is doing, and here it is, talk of the devil. Let's see how it gets on up the incline. See which other locos you can spot in the sidings, and comment down below if you can spot an odd one out. Anyway, here comes the B1. Let's see how it gets on around the curves on the slight incline. Look at that. How refreshing is that to see a loco not slow down around those curves? And do you know what? I'm putting out less power than normal too because of how fast this runs. So that was just doing that on 40% speed and it did not noticeably at least slow down. So torque in the mechanism, really, really good. And like a lot of locos that are produced like this, from a distance, this actually looks fine. I think the paintwork and the performance go together here to make the loco look excellent from a distance. Up close, it's obviously a much poorer looking model and that heavily calls the price into question. But to be fair to it, because the performance is so good and because the decoration is so good too, yeah, it does look absolutely fine as it runs. A lot of issues with this. I don't know whether the tender wheel problem is an issue with just mine because obviously something happened to it in transit or whether that's a more common issue. So I wouldn't pay too much attention to that, particularly if your track work is good. But, you know, consider that if you want to. Ultimately, though, I still can't really see a reason why you would want to go for this one instead of the Hornby one. So only if you're really desperate to own a B1 and you're not willing to wait for Hornby to release a new batch, could I even think to start recommending this? Because it's really not meeting the mark in many areas. However, at a decent discount, it's a good looking model, at least from a distance, and it runs well too. So yeah, for £125 or something like that, if you must purchase one and you can't find a Hornby one for a better price, then yeah, I guess I could recommend it. Otherwise though, I think this is just one to move on from. 
I think this is actually a real missed opportunity because this could have made for a great budget model. I think the age and relative simplicity of the body would mean that Bikeman could actually produce this quite cheaply if they wanted to. And if they wanted to, I believe they could have made this a much more budget offering, which could have turned up at the retailers for a hundred or 120 odd pounds, something like that, and made a really decent beginner's model or casual enthusiast's model. Instead, they didn't do that. They priced this pretty much in line with more modern locos and it's pretty obvious from just a quick glance that this isn't one of those so it was unreasonable i think for backman to have done that but anyway those are my thoughts there's good and bad in it like most locos i've presented the good and bad to you it's up to you now to make up your mind and now let's have some ratings on the backman b1 overall quite a disappointing model not one that i think i could recommend the detail I've given two star because it's clearly a very old body. A lot of the details are very coarse now, particularly the holders that hold the handrails. Really bad cab detail, nothing painted inside there, all moulded detail as well. Poor moulding in other areas, the whistle actually on closer inspection of the footage, there's some poor moulding on that, two halves of the mould not lining up properly, that's a common issue too, there are other details on the running plate that are the same. It is well decorated, that's mainly where its two star comes from, that is the one aspect of the model that is done better than Hornby's I think. Performance I've given three star, now this loco had a real chance to shine on performance because the torque in the mechanism is fantastic, it's beautifully powerful and it runs really nice and smoothly with no slowing down or anything like that, even with a load. However, possibly due to the motor, possibly due to the lack of flywheel, it's just not that great at the slow speeds. It judders along a little bit, perhaps it's the gearing as well actually because it is a fastish runner. So there's that. There's also the issue of the derailing tender, which I'm not going to lean on too heavily, but there is certainly an issue with the tender wheels of some description because that front axle came out of position twice. Otherwise though, generally speaking, and assuming that the tender issue on my example is just a one-off fault, the performance is actually really excellent, if not quite as good at the slow speeds. Pulling power though is really good. It's better than I would have expected for a loco of this weight. 0.4 newtons or 25 coaches that's about the same as a hornby a3 or a4 pretty good i think for a loco with an all plastic body i assume that's because of the high torque of the mechanism which really helps this loco to power through the mechanism though is just a middle of the road for me i've given it two and a half star on the downside it doesn't have tender pickups which is annoying it's also got the dcc socket crammed into the loco for some reason rather than in the tender where there'd be much more space for larger decoders and a higher quality speaker speaking of speakers there is no speaker in this locomotive I feel i'm overusing the word speaker now somewhat but that'll do i think and while i don't know whether the motor is a three or a five pole one i can be fairly certain that it doesn't have a flywheel which is a pity given how much this cost the quality of the model then, I've given three and a half star. Generally, the way that this has been assembled is really good. I'm not really gonna fault that. It does lose a couple of marks though because of the plastic body construction. A die cast running plate at the very least seems like the bare minimum these days, particularly given the RRP of 180 quid. And also some of those poorly molded parts are also not acceptable on a modern and expensive model. So it loses just a star and a half for that. Value for money then, I have to say the full RRP of this is a complete rip-off. An old body with almost no features and the bare minimum in terms of detail. Really, really not impressed by that price. Quite the rip-off. The price I paid is a lot more like it, £125.96. Yeah, that is more representative of the budget model that this absolutely is and should have been. So I'd have given that four stars. So I've split the difference and given it two and a half do not pay more than I did because the model just isn't worth it, at least not in my opinion. Overall then, that is a score of 5.79 out of 10, mainly let down by the lack of detail and the high price. That's a grade of F, which means I cannot recommend this loco to you. Like I said earlier on, go for a Hornby one second hand if you can, otherwise if you're not that bothered, I would just go without, it's not worth it. Into the logbook we go, and it is 12th place below the Small England and above the Hornby Railroad 1400. Well folks, that will just about do it for this review. Do you know what? I've enjoyed looking at a double O gauge steam locomotive for a change. 
I've been doing a lot of 009 and N scale and American stuff and all sorts recently. It's been nice to go back to my bread and butter. I think it would have been nicer if this was a better loco, that's for sure. But I've got my eye on a few, well, a few models that I hope will be better anyway. You never quite know, and this loco teaches you that. But uh, yeah, so stay tuned. I will have more reviews coming soon, hopefully more positive ones than this. But for now, let me know what you think about this. Have I been too harsh? Have I not been harsh enough? Any opinions on that would be very much welcomed. Any feedback at all. But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one. All right, cheers, folks. You take care.